I've made a lot of tutorials on this channel in the past. The front lever tutorial, the Alex Migos rings tutorial, some mental training for climbing videos. But this video, this video is like the real deal. This is the tutorial I'm really, really proud about. The things I'm going to talk about, it's going to be pretty high yield and it'll help you break past your bouldering plateau. So in this video, I'm going to share how I discovered a remarkable training routine that brought my moonboard sends from V4, V5 plateau back in November 2021 to my first ever V8 in February 2022. So it's about four months in laps. And I actually discovered this on accident. To explain the origin of this routine though, I have to backtrack a little bit to explain why I only train three days a week. Yes, I only train three days a week. Back in September 2021, I developed really bad chronic PIP joint synovitis or inflammation of this joint. The pain was so bad that I could barely pull myself up on some easy climbs and it really made me reevaluate my training. The injury made me realize that I was climbing too often, more than what my body can handle. Being unemployed and off of school for quite some time around that time, I used to climb so much. I would train hard almost four days a week and it brought along overuse injuries. And you would think that climbing that much would make me better. But I was actually stuck at climbing V4 and V5s on the moonboard for the longest time. And I look back at it now knowing why. Number one, I barely let myself rest. My body was breaking down faster than what it can build back up. Number two, I rarely trained or worked out outside of climbing. My body is very comfortable maintaining the V4, V5 climbing, but I found in the past that if you want to break through plateaus, you have to add some form of extra training that is not climbing that will work your fingers and your back more systematically. So because of the finger injury, I took one and a half months off to rehab it, and I resumed climbing around November 2021 normally. Around that time, my first year of medical school started to get pretty rigorous, and mostly from the pressure of school, I wanted to train as little as possible and still see significant gains. I decided to only train three days a week. This was one of the main changes that immediately gave me gains. It simply allowed me to rest my body more because before I would refuse to rest. So this is how I split my three days of training per week. I would moonboard high volume on Mondays, work on weighted pull-ups, which later transitioned to one-arm pull-ups on Wednesdays, and I would moonboard limit boulders on Fridays. So these were the primary things that I work on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but there are also other extra high yield stuff that I would do on those days and I'll explain later. Tuesdays and Thursdays are designated rest days and on Saturday and Sunday, depending on how my schedule is, I can go outdoors and climb with my friends or I can just totally take the weekend off. Compared to other training schedules online, I liked how my Monday, Wednesday, Friday would be fixed. For example, Hosok's schedule is never the same from week to week and it's kind of a nightmare. I don't, I don't want to guess what type of training I'm going to do every day. I'd rather just have it set so I know I will climb Monday, train Wednesday, climb Friday. That's just a preference but I really like having a set schedule. Also, it may seem weird to climb only two days a week, but it allowed me to rest my fingers more and on the days that I actually climbed, they were always well recovered enough for me to try really hard. Ever since doing this, my fingers have been the healthiest and the strongest they've ever been while still climbing hard. I think what also adds to my healthy fingers is the extensive warm-up I do before each session. I set up a warm-up period of about 30 minutes. Within those 30 minutes, I climb from V0 to around V5 or V6 with ample time of just not climbing. Your body doesn't only warm up when you climb. During times when you sit down, there are also other physiological things that happen that help you get adjusted to climbing hard. So here you can see that I'm climbing some easy routes. Notice how I'm not climbing all the time. After each climb, I wait about three, four, five minutes before I hop on to the next climb. And I keep repeating that for the whole 30 minutes. And at the end, I do this V6 and I know my body's pretty warm, but still when I transition to the moon board, I do some warm up laps on big holds just to get adjusted to the steepness of the board because the steepness is something that's very unique to the moonboard and you have to kind of get warm on that even though you warmed up earlier. All right, so enough of warming up. Let's break down my weekly routine starting with Monday, which is high volume moonboard bouldering, except with a twist. There's something that I've been doing in the past couple of months that have been very, very high yield. I simply challenge myself to climb the V4 benchmarks without cutting feet. I try to apply as much body tension as I can while I climb. So yes, this is the most high yield point of this whole video. The thing that helped me the most with my climbing was training to climb all the V4s with better technique, without cutting feet, learning how to apply that body tension. But again, learning to climb static on the moonboard, which is 40 degrees, is extremely difficult in the beginning. I would cut all the time, all the time. I would ask more experienced climbers how to have better body tension, and they literally would just say, climb more. That was no help at all, but I have a solution. The best help I could get at the time was getting beta from this guy named Andy Liu, 84, on YouTube. If you've been climbing for a while, you know who Andy Liu is. 
and it was actually such a brilliant idea. I would watch his beta and try to imitate his movements as much as possible. I learned that he was 5'7 and I was 5'8, so most of the things that he can reach, I could probably reach, assuming that we have the same ape index. I was training on a moonboard, he was training on a moonboard, and this exchange of beta that he was giving me, it's like I was having a personal coach. It's like him saying, okay, you can reach this, you can reach this. Even though you can't do it right now in your physical state, you can reach this if you get stronger. As a side note, Andy Liu, he only posts moonboard beta for the 2017 set. But for the 2016 and the 2019 set, Alan Hauser on YouTube is really good as well. So I recommend looking at those betas. But that's really the trick, like you watch beta to know which moves are possible to not cut feet on. So then you train those moves over and over again until you are able to not cut feet on them. Copying these videos though is really hard. Doing this can be very discouraging because you might only finish one or two problems clean within a day, but it's well worth it. It's better to end a session with less completions, but you learn something than to just keep practicing bad technique the whole session. But when I compare me and Andy Leo climb, I just I'm overwhelmed with the sense that there's a huge void in our skill levels. Breaking down his movement, his ability to keep his body tension and climb statically required a lot of finger strength, lock off strength, and core lower body engagement. These are the limitations that restricted me from climbing clean without cutting feet. If you really think about it, when you climb static, you're requiring a lot more finger strength. Let's say I'm on this hold and I'm reaching for the next hold, a lot of the load is on this hand while nothing is on this hand until I grab the next one. So it requires a lot more finger strength, a lot more lock off strength compared to if I were to jump. There's no weight on both of these fingers because I'm in the air. I grab the next hold and now the force distribution is in, it's like distributed between the two hands rather than just one hand. So climbing dynamic, it's a lot less finger strength. I can just say though by training static, it's just way well worth it when you're climbing outdoors because there's a lot of climbers outdoors where you can't just keep dynamically jumping for things. You have to do static stuff. Three of the biggest things that I saw lacking between my sends and Andy Liu's moonboard benchmark sends were finger strength, lock off strength, and core slash lower body engagement. After specifically training these three things, my sends got significantly, significantly better. So if I were to answer my question from months ago, how do I have better body tension? The answer is to start working on finger strength, lock off strength, and core lower body engagement. These three things are added onto my weekly training schedule as shown here. I'll break that down now and explain my rationale for each element. So this is how I train finger strength. I practice max hangs after my moonboard session. Now hold up, I know you're gonna jump at me and say, injuries, but no, no, let me explain. On Mondays and Wednesdays, I climb on the moonboard, but I only go up into a certain point. There's a point where you're fresh and there's a point where you're literally dead from the moonboard. I cut my moonboard sessions short, so I'm around the 70% threshold before going to like complete fatigue and I start my max hangs there. Genuinely, I feel like at that point, my fingers are the most warm and they can take the most hit. At the 70% mark, I've been climbing on the moonboard for quite a bit. My fingers are the most warm. I could probably load quite a bit when I do max hangs and it's a lot less injury prone than if you were to do max hangs near the fresher point. That's just my preference and honestly, when I first started doing this, I was also very skeptical of it, knowing that it might be very injury prone. A lot of my friends would tell me like they wouldn't trust it, but my fingers have been feeling so much better and they've been feeling so much stronger ever since I've been doing this. There's really no drawback that I've found. So yeah, let me know in the comments what you think. In terms of the hold sizes, I've been working my way down. So at first, like when I first started hangboarding, I obviously would do the biggest edge with no weight. And then I started gradually adding more weight as soon as I felt more comfortable. As soon as the weight got too heavy on my hips, I went down to a smaller edge with no weight and then I started adding weight and the cycle continues. Lately I've been doing weights, um, six, added 65 pounds on the 15 millimeter edge, which is like the smallest edge on the Beastmaker 2000. For each max hang session, I do three sets and I try to hold around five to seven seconds and that would end my session. So I, I would go home from the gym after that. Um, and there's a there's kind of like a reasoning behind why I do this. It's kind of like the concept of Dragon Ball Z hyperbolic time chamber. You want to train yourself to hold a specific load that your body does not have, which is the added pounds. And I'm training on small edges, really small edges that are smaller than what can be found on the moonboard. Because the moonboard, the holds are not ergonomic, but a lot of the holds are pretty big. So I'm pretty much training myself to be more than ever prepared for every hold type that I'm grabbing by hanging on really small holds with weight. And then once I hit the moonboard, 
it should be easier theoretically. And once again, I would hangboard twice a week, Mondays and Fridays on the days that I would be climbing. Some of the holds on the moonboard as well, they are pinches. So then I would, there was like these pinch holds at my gym that I sometimes just hang my body on with no extra weight, just like for fun. But I, I never put like really much intention into it. Gradually I got stronger and then I got to like hold them longer. But that's pretty much it for my finger strength training. We're gonna move on to what I do on Wednesdays. And Wednesdays, I do not climb at all and I mainly focus on training my lock-off strength. At first, I used to do a lot of weighted pull-ups, but I've kind of transitioned into wanting to learn the one-arm pull-up, and that has helped a lot too. In terms of body tension, being able to lock off helps tremendously. I found that on some climbs, if I can't lock off right, my feet would just cut. So being able to lock off, that's like one of the components of just being very controlled on the wall, and it's very crucial. And something that's very high yield is just doing weighted pull-ups. My training for the lock-offs have obviously changed over the years as I got more strong. I'm just gonna list out everything that I do now and you can omit certain exercises if needed. So first when I walk into the gym, I just warm up. So I walk upstairs, crank out like six pull-ups and then I let my body adjust to warming up. Um, after I feel like I'm warm enough, I start doing weighted pull-ups and I do the max amount that I can. Um, I do three sets of three to five reps. But most of the time, I don't really make it to five. I usually only do like three or four. After the weighted pull-ups, I would do one-arm negatives. I do three sets of two reps on each side. I know, I know that one-arm negatives sometimes have a bad rep of causing a lot of injury. That's why I only did it after I was able to do weighted pull-ups with added plus 60% body weight. So I was 140. I, would, I only started doing one-arm negatives once I was able to do weighted pull-ups with like an added 80 pounds for three reps. Um, so if you're not there yet, don't do one-arm negatives. That would be my recommendation. But what you can do is what I do next in my sets, which is two to three sets of three to five assisted one arms with like a assisted band, which helps. So I'll just list out the things that I do in a day for my lock off training. I don't do Frenchies because I think they're too easy and don't provide enough stimulus for the power that I'm trying to train for. Um, I think Frenchies are good for like endurance, but that wasn't what I was training for within the last few months. In between sets of the pull exercises, I usually do like other antagonist stuff like flies on the rings or I do a bench or I do like wrist extensions to do the antagonist um, stuff for your forearm. I'm not very specific on how much I do for those. I just do them just to have some antagonistic training in. And sometimes like if I'm really bored, I also like stretch in between sets. There's also one very high yield thing that I do on Wednesdays which is this TRX workout by Hooper's Beta. I'll put the link in the description. What it entails is I just use a TRX and I put my toes on the loops and I just push and pull with my legs. I do about two to three sets of eight to 12 reps. For one rep, I count it as left out, right out, one. Left out, right out, two. This exercise specifically trains you to engage your lower chain and lower extremities and it will really help you keep your feet on the wall. It's kind of like training you to just pull with your feet once you're on the wall. And once I did that, a lot of the moves that I previously would always cut on, I would be able to stick. Super, super high yield exercise, and I only do it once a week. Definitely should add it to your training routine if you want to train body tension. What I also like about Wednesdays is after I'm done doing my pull exercises, and once I'm done doing the lower body stuff, I'm done with the training day. I only take about two hours to finish everything, and I can go home. Now we're gonna move on to Friday. Friday is my limit boulder days. I try moonboard problems that are pretty hard for me and most of the time I still try the V4 problems because there's a lot of V4 problems that are hard. Even now after I stand V8 like there's two problems that are really hard for me. On the rare days though I would venture out of V4, V5 range. I target V6, V7, V8. The thing about doing limit bouldering on Friday is that two days prior you train lock off the lock-off training really shocks your body and it makes you strong two days afterwards, which is the Friday that I do limit bouldering. I find that I'm incredibly strong usually on Fridays and that's why I arrange my schedule the way it is. For the problems that I try, I still consult Andy Liu's beta for help to see what moves that he cuts on. So I'm constantly training my body tension awareness. And once again, just like Mondays, I still keep about 30% of my reserve left. That way I could train max hangs at the end of my session. After I do max hang, I go home. Now I'm just going to talk a little bit about tips for body tension. I found in one of Eric Carlson's bouldering videos this really cool exercise where you can figure out what your max reach is on the moonboard just by 
grabbing onto the biggest holds and then walking your feet down, counting how many rows that you go down. That way you know what your max span is. I think for me, right here, I am spanning from row three to row 13, and that's my max span. It just gives you a rough estimate of how much you can span on the board. Another thing about body tension, there are some times where you want to grab a hold really bad, and once you grab it, you end up pulling really hard with that top hand. If you want to keep the body tension, it's helpful if you don't pull up too hard because if you pull up really hard, you lose the friction in your feet, your feet lift and it will cut. So what I found on the moon board is if there's something that I really want to stick, I don't pull straight up in line with the wall. I pull perpendicular to the wall. That way it sucks me into the wall rather than pulling me up. I hope that makes sense. If you pull inwards, your feet aren't lifted upwards. The last thing is just to watch a lot and a lot of beta, try to experiment on ways that you can replicate that beta and not cut feet. Learning to weight your feet takes so much time and I would fail all the time. And I gotta say Hooper's betas exercise really helps a lot. So really check it out. Not a lot of people do it, but it's super, super good. The first day that I did it, I was so sore under my calf and eventually like it was second nature after like a couple weeks of trying it out. But yeah, after a while, adding all of these elements, the finger strength, the lock-off strength, and the lower extremity strength, it gradually helped me culminate into achieving my first V8, and I was super proud of it. And yeah, that's my story. Having the pure intention to not cut feet as much as possible, working on body tension while going through the V4 benchmarks, even though you're only working V4s, like the skill that I was able to get, it translated to a V8. So yeah, I hope this video helps. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe because it just motivates me to make more videos like this. So yeah, catch you in the next video.